Good morning. It is so good to see so many smiling faces out there today. I'm just, I am, I'm stoked, I'm encouraged, I'm tired, and for those of you who know, sometimes I get a little bit more emotional in, uh, in my presentation, you know, when, uh, when I'm tired. So anyhow, um, I hope that won't turn out to be weird. Anyhow, uh, we're picking up our series through the first Corinthian letter. Uh, we're going to be in chapter five. Now, in, in chapter five, uh, it, it, it's, it actually talks a lot about pride. Uh, this, this discussion actually starts in chapter four, but I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But the destructive nature of pride is actually seen throughout scripture uh job 33 17 says that it is god's job to keep man from pride uh let not the foot of pride come upon me says the psalmist in chapter 36 verse 11 Uh, proverbs chapter 16 verse 18 clearly says that it is pride that goes uh, before destruction. Pride will lead people uh, into a destructive situation. According to Jeremiah 39, God is going to destroy pride. Uh, it, there's a, a cute little story. It's about a turtle did not want to winter through the snow, and so he wanted to go to Florida, but it's too far to travel, and so he's thinking, how am I going to get there? Uh, you know, uh, uh, before, you know, too long. So he talks to a couple of geese and they agree to carry him. So, so one goose puts a rope in his mouth. The other goose puts a rope in his mouth and the turtle just clamps with his, you know, his powerful, uh, snapper turtle jaw right there on that rope and they take off and they're just there. He's on his way to Florida. He is so happy. Someone looked up and said, whose idea was that? The turtle just could not contain and contain himself. He said, I did. Yeah. Proverbs tells us there, uh, a man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will obtain honor. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 23. We cannot overstate the harmfulness of pride especially should it give the child of God the idea that any sin can be entered into without concern of God's retribution against such practiced and illicit behaviors. However, I do want us to understand that uh, not all pride is wrong. And, and I want to point this out because in your reading, you may have run across this passage because I, Isaiah chapter 60, verse 15, it tells us there that God will make the city of Zion an everlasting pride. Pride, then, must be kept within a certain context. Allow others to point such things out. Allow others to state such things. Allow others to say, that Church of Christ people, they're a proudful folk for the things that they teach, which is rightly so. We can take pride in the truth that God gives to us for both our learning, our understanding, our growing in faith, and then our ability to teach and share with others because I am then teaching and sharing with them something not of my own. Because if I'm teaching them some something of my own, don't you think that might be coming from pride? Teach them God's stuff. Let God be the one to bring them round. The situation that we're looking at today, <clears throat> it is the second great sin uh, of the many that Paul, that Paul speaks to the Corinthians about. And it actually begins in chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles open to chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians, we're going to quickly run through that. So I'm going to let you use your scanning abilities. I'm not going to read it. I just want to point out six things 
from chapter 4 that actually help to serve as a backdrop for what we're going to look at in chapter 5. Number one, there is a state of humility which should exist within preachers. Number two, he says that leaders are to prove their faithfulness and how they minister in relation to man's judgment. He again emphasizes that a puffed up Attitude should be refrained from. I am told that the word for puffed up uh, uh, is, is a term, maybe it comes from, uh, developed into a Latin word, which talks about the air used to uh, make a wind instrument work. Have you ever watched somebody do bagpipes, somebody that is practiced? They can keep that thing moving and you watch their cheeks because they can inhale at the same time while allowing their cheek muscles to continue to operate that wind instrument. It's really interesting how they do that. He then points out, number four, how this prideful behavior begins to affect the reality of how God's grace operates. That's problematic. Number five, Paul then reminds these brethren of the reality of suffering in ministry that Paul... Apollos and others face, the purpose of his relating this is to act as a rebuttal to their pridefulness. Number six, Paul then concludes chapter four with a loving exhortation for the brethren to be imitators of him. All of this, again, serves as a backdrop for what we're going to talk about in chapter five. So continuing on in chapter five, Let's let's look at verses 1 and 2, because actually verses 1 and 2, you know, I, I am told, uh, and, and, and you may know this, I've shared with it before, but a good sermon outline, a, a teacher will go into class, or a preacher will get up before the congregation, and what they're supposed to do is tell the audience where they are, where they're going, and then why. Okay? That's, what, that's, that's kind of what we're supposed to do. So we're going to be talking about pride. We're going to be talking about that sin. But, but this is what Paul does in these first two verses. Notice what he says here. It is actually reported that there, that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such kind as does not even exist among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. And you have become arrogant and have not mourned instead, in order that the one who has done this uh, deed might be removed from your midst. Everything that Paul is going to talk about in the rest of chapter 5 has just been mentioned right here. There's a sin. There's a solution. He talks about the attitudes that bring about that problem. He talks about the attitudes that should be involved in solving that issue. And so this is what he does. And so when he, when he says it's, it's reported, the Greek word that is used here is, uh, okay, so for us basic Greek students, it is the present passive indicative. What this means is, I know that kind of just went, it still kind of goes over my head a lot. It's like, what? Uh, so I let them define what all, well, that all, what all that means, and so I'll define that for you. What that means is the way that God told them to write this word is to help us understand how detrimental what it is they are doing, because when it says it is reported, it is being continued to be reported. This problem is so bad, It is so out in the open, everybody is hearing about it. Everybody in the church and everybody outside the church. This is not the kind of message that the church is supposed to be sending. It is not the kind of teaching that we are supposed to be involved in. It is not the kind of life that God wants shared by these Corinthian brethren or any other, any other person in Christ's body. <clears throat> Maybe it was Chloe 
who said this. When you look back at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11, it says, I've been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Did Chloe share anything else? You know, I don't know. Maybe she did. Maybe she didn't. It's a possibility. Uh, but, but the point is, is that Paul, who's not even there, has heard of what's going on. And so he writes about it. You know, it is argued by scholarly types. Look back at what's said again. Someone has his father's wife. There is hardly anything talked about the woman and the sin she's involved in. Why is that? Some have argued, you know, the, the, the so-called scholarly types, you know, uh, that they weren't really married. They weren't really married. So it's, you know... Uh, he doesn't really have her, you know, as his wife. It, so, what difference does it make? They're saying that, uh, she's just, she was just merely a concubine or a mistress. So, does it make the sin any less? But again, scripture is telling us it's pointing out the focus is on what he did and not what she did. This matters because she may not have been a member of the church. Let's, let's skip ahead just a little bit here. Read, read down here to, um, I, he says, uh, I didn't mean at all with the immoral people, verse 10, or with the covetous uh, swindlers, because he says, I wrote you not to associate with immoral people. What Paul says here in verses 9, 10, and 11 is that there are groups of people that we should associate with who behave exactly like this. That's kind of weird, isn't it? We're supposed to be going to the places to share the gospel of Christ. I had, I had a conversation with an elder from Florida 30 some years ago. And he told me, he says, you need to be going to those bars. I was not comfortable with that. It was still early on in my, uh, admitted addiction to alcohol. I don't think it was the right place for me to be going at the time. I look back and it's like, you know, there, there would have, there were a few people in the church that would have gone with me. We could have done that. Why does he tell me to go to the bars? His words were, and I quote, you would be surprised at how many members of the church you'll find there in that little town of Forsyth, Montana. Folks. Paul says, don't associate with these kinds of people who are members of the church. You need to put these people behind. And why is, you know, why is he saying all this? Because he says, not even the Gentiles do that. When he says not even the Gentiles, he's using this old covenant illustration. This, because in the old covenant, there were two groups of people. There were the children of God and everybody else was called a Gentile. So when Paul uses that verbiage in the New Testament, what he is saying is, not even the members, not even the people outside the church, not even the unsaved behave in this way. Now, folks, I will say that it's, it's not, because you can look through history and you will see, uh, that, that people did involve themselves in incest. The word incest, uh, it, it, it basically means unclean, unholy, you know, unchaste, uh, it's an unchaste thing. Um, and, and there were group, but the point is, is that in Corinth, as immoral as this city was, Paul is saying, not even these people see this as a good thing. Page two. <clears throat> 
Leviticus chapter 18. There's, there's two places in Leviticus. If you have, if you're making notes, these are long readings. Okay. But in Leviticus 18, verses 6 through 30, and then also chapter 20, verses 10 through uh, 21, both of these passages list a whole lot of things that are unholy in the mind of God. In our Bible class this morning, there was an illustration about a lady from the West Coast who had that usual liberal, uh, immoral, West Coast attitude, um, but but it it got so bad where she was living morally that she left. Why do I mention that? Everybody has a value system. Everybody has a value system. Everybody looks at something as being right or wrong. The reality at this point has nothing to do with the argument. Everybody has their own concept of what they see as being good or bad. But when we look at these texts in Leviticus, we have to understand this is coming from the mind of God. It is God's value system which should set the standard. It is God who says what is holy. It is God who says what is not holy. Okay? His is the only value system that anybody should ever measure uh, or, or, or pattern any value, si- value system after. So if you say something, uh, if you say something is good or bad, I, I, I could agree with you. If what you say is good or bad compared to what God teaches as being good, or bad. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Here's the big question in the context of everything that Paul is trying to teach here. here yes, sir. Um, what chapter and we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're looking at verse 2. That good question. I apologize if I'm not communicating that well enough. The big question here is, How are the saints in Corinth supposed to convert people to a holy life when the example of holiness, which they themselves are setting, is less than what the Corinthians are already practicing? They see no benefit of coming to Christ. See see, see the point? So here's this attitudinal error which is coming out here. He says, you've become arrogant and have not mourned instead. And that's the contrast. Pridefulness versus (laughs) mourning. The kind of mourning that is described here in in the writer's choice, uh, word choice again, is the kind of mourning that you go through at a funeral for somebody that was very close to you. You can't hold back the tears. I was at my mom's bedside the moment she died. And I look back at that and I think, I handled it wrong, absolutely wrong. The things that should have been in my mother's ears at the moment of of her passing should have been a smile on my face expressing to her the great love and admiration I have had for her for all that she did bringing me up in this world. My mom didn't make all the best choices. Who does? My mom died a saint. And I should have confirmed that with her. Instead of looking at her 75-pound skeletal frame, which cancer had eaten. Anyway, you guys get my point. It's that morning. 
That is the morning that these people should have been involved in when they saw their very brother in Christ making such a detrimental decision. Why were they prideful? What would cause them to do that? Turn to the Roman letter for a minute. I'll show you exactly what's going on here. Because Paul had this conversation with others. I'm sure he had it with these folks. And because we know that Paul said, the same things I teach in one church, I teach in every church. So we know that as his letters were constructed and copied, they were sent and passed around. Did the Corinthians get this letter before or did they get the, did they get this letter after the letter Paul wrote to him? I don't know, but they eventually got it. The first two verses of Romans chapter 6 say this, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? If we have died to sin, let's leave it buried in the dirt. That's where it belongs. But that's exactly what they were doing. They were taking pride in the fact that they just, they just misplaced their pride. How many of us are prideful of the fact that we have the blood of Christ? I am. But let's not allow that pride to go to such a degree that I have the blood of Christ, therefore I can do whatever. Because it just don't work that way. So they need an attitude adjustment. You've got to remove the person that's doing all this sinning. You've got to get him out of your midst. Might be removed from your midst, verse 2. For I on my part, though, though absent, uh, I'm getting ahead. I, there, there is a, when a person is removed from the church, uh, the church actually in the first century continued with a practice, uh, of, of how the synagogues would remove someone from their midst who was unrepentant. And the same kinds of things that they were doing, well, we don't do, you know, because one of the things that they would do is they would, uh, uh, they would beat a person. The congregation would, I don't know how they did this. You know, if somebody's sinning, you know, they'd all take a whack at him, you know. We jokingly say on a birthday, okay, line up. You're going to get your spankings, right? Well, we do that, you know, it's, you know, all in jest. I have yet to see anybody get a spanking. Somebody got a birthday coming up? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, but that's one of the things they do. But the other thing that they did do, which the church is supposed to do today, for an unrepenting brother or sister in Christ is to basically turn our backs on them. We are supposed to... We have a fellowship meal every second Sunday of the month. We come in here and, and, and we share a meal together and, and laughter and joy and conversation and maybe a few too many trips to the, to the dessert table. The unrepentant person is not allowed to eat with us. We are not allowed to eat with them. And that's what Paul is saying. You've got to remove this person from your fellowship. <clears throat> so Paul's... Uh, uh, I, I don't want to use the word conclusion, but 
but with the situation in the mind of Paul, he does say some things that he has come to a decision on. Let's read verses 3, 4, and 5. On my part, though absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I, I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. I'm so glad that Paul ended that uh, statement the way he did. Church discipline isn't just for the sake of punishing somebody. It is for the express purpose of bringing them around to a, a, a personal choice of, I, I can't live this way any longer. I can't live away from my family anymore. If I want to be back with my family and, and I, I, I've been doing this and I want to be here, I can't be here unless I get rid of this. Help me God to get rid of this because this is where I want to be. And that's what Paul is saying. You know, some say, well, you know, Paul, Paul, Paul isn't there. He's not an actual witness to this. Isn't, isn't all this just at this point hearsay? Maybe. Maybe not. Does it make a judgment upon the actual sin wrong, though? Because the sin itself is wrong, right? Hey, Paul is saying here, he says, notice what he says, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I am, he says, I'm with you in spirit. And so what he's saying here in verse 4 is, I am, I am put in this situation all in the hands of, of, of my Lord and Savior. Paul had the ability, he had the miraculous ability. And so when he says, I've turned this person over, uh, for the destruction of his, of his flesh, to what degree? Well, it's not going to be to such a degree that he loses his life because he's actually doing this for the express purpose of bringing him around to repenting from the situation and changing it. That's why he's doing this. Doesn't mean there isn't going to be some physical suffering uh, that doesn't transpire on the part of this individual, because it's going to happen. The church did this to a couple of liars in Acts chapter 5, remember? These were, this was a husband and wife, a brother and sister in Christ. They were greedy and then lied about their greed. And the apostles asked them, and actually they didn't ask them, you lied to the Holy Spirit and they both lost their lives. Um, there's another fella uh, in Acts, wrote it down, Acts uh, somewhere, Elimus, Acts chapter 13, verse, verse 11. Uh, this guy was a sorcerer. He wasn't uh, a, a member of the church, but there was pain and suffering brought upon him physically for the things that he was doing against God. You know, we pray. This is an interesting concept. I'm just going to toss this out here. If you all have a, a, an idea or concept, a Bible passage, maybe to uh, follow this up with, I would be encouraged for you to share it with me so that I could add it to my uh, Corinthian notebook. If anybody online watching has a thought, I would encourage, you know, the uh, comments from them. As well, we pray. Thank God. It's good to see our young brother Paul here. He's he's recovering from his surgery. Uh, I got a note from Aaron. His scans were good. We pray for their healing. Amen. Is it wrong for us to pray for the destruction of somebody's flesh if they're unrepentant? I wonder. 
I don't know that it's something that we really want to see happen. But if God will put them into a situation that will wake them up, what's wrong with that? Something to chew on, anyway. First Peter chapter 2. Let's look at a couple of passages here. First Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> it says here, uh, verses 11 and 12. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers. What does he call us, aliens and strangers? We are in the world, not of the world. Okay? That's the point. We're aliens and strangers. We're in the kingdom, but, but the kingdom of heaven is where our, 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 our destination is. And until we're at that final destination, we are strangers and aliens. Okay? Uh, he says, abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, on account of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. God, I get the idea from this passage that God is going to ask that unsaved soul, why in the world did you hammer my children the way you did? What did they do that was wrong? Well, God, I, I really didn't like, I, I didn't like what they were saying, but, uh, but really, they were good people. They did good things. They're, that's what they're going to have to say. That's what they should say. That's what Paul is trying to fix in the Corinthian letter so that the people of Corinth can look at the church. They might not like the story of Jesus Christ, but Paul doesn't want them speaking ill of the children of God. So he's trying to fix the situation. Another passage, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, that which is acceptable and perfect. Right? Isaiah chapter 35, verse 8. I found this passage uh, in studying for this. Um, and I thought... You know, in, in Isaiah, there's, there are a few chapters there where Isaiah is describing the, the church that will, the body of Christ. He's looking ahead and he's, he's got all these comments about it. And one of the things that he says of where we are, he calls it a highway of holiness. Isaiah chapter 35, verse 8. That's just, that's a pretty neat description. We're on a highway of holiness. Well, the Corinthian brethren weren't. Who was it wrote that song? 70s. They want a highway to hell. What's that? ACDC. Of all the bands to know what that was, that, that was the one. Yeah, anyway, okay. Uh, yeah. James chapter 1, verse 21, it says, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness in humility, in humility, he's letting them know, folks, your pride is preventing you from doing this. So in humility... Receive the word implanted, which is able to save your soul. Amen? So Paul, you know, in verse 4, he talks about the fact that he has, he has this authority there in, uh, in Corinthians. Let me go back over there because he says, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, where is it here? Uh, in the name of our Lord Jesus. He's, he's, he's pointing out the authority that he has. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 5, it mentions the phrase apostolic authority. That matches with the prayer that Jesus said in John chapter 17 when, when Jesus prayed that, that our religious unity 
uh, uh, the one church which Christ uh, died to create, it would all be based upon apostolic authority. Not modern day apostles. Why not modern day apostles? Because they don't fit the uh, uh, the definition of what a modern day apostle is according to the epistle of John. Because an apostle had to be someone who heard in the presence of Jesus' teaching, had to see him, had to be able to touch him. All right. Anybody else who calls him uh, calls himself an apostle today, uh, I, I would be very careful of trusting anything else they have to say. Um. So in the rest of this chapter, verse six and following, there is a situation which the church involves itself in. Uh, and and whether it is the fellowship here, and I th- I think that it's talking about the communion because of the wording that's used. He says uh, he says here, beginning in verse uh, six, your boasting's not good. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, has also been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. It's interesting how he talks about uh, a, a, a sin, which is a piece of leavening, because it can affect the whole, and he calls us an unleavened group here. And so he ties that to this Holy Communion that we take part in every first day of the week, according to Scripture. Um, It's interesting that he does that. He's saying this sin, which needs serious attention, needs to be taken care of. It's going to harm the whole group if not. So he says in verse 9 following, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. Now, I didn't mean with the immoral people of the world or with covetous or swindlers or with idolaters, for then you'd have to go out of the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he should be an immoral person. And that just that one phrase there, that kind of encapsulates the whole list of what could be described as being unholy, right? So whatever whatever sin list you find uh, in Scripture, um, it would fit right there. But but he gets a little bit more uh, descriptive here when when he says uh, or covetous or an idolater or reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. There goes potluck, right? He says, for what do I have to do with judging outsiders? And we don't. We we are not in the business of judging people outside the church. Why is that? They don't know any better. They just simply don't. Who's been ruling their life for as long as they've existed up to that point? Certainly hadn't been God. It's been Satan. We got to get people away from Satan. And until then, we don't judge outsiders, but we do judge those in the church. Okay? He says, Do you not judge those who are within the church? Those who are outside, God judges. Now, in my version, I have all capitals here in this last sentence. Now, the reason the writers of the uh, New American Standard Version do that is because they're, they're actually quoting an Old Testament reference here. That, that reference being, uh, where is it here? Uh, Deuteronomy. But I think another reason why I like to see this capitalized here is because of what he is here commanding. 
Get this wicked thing out of your presence. That's what he's wanting done. Folks, Jesus died to take care of the problem of sin. You know that? He took upon him the whole, all the sins, the whole world. John chapter 3 tells this. When he went to Calvary. What that means is, you and me, as sinners, have no hope of heaven apart from Jesus and his sacrifice. The only way that we can get to heaven is if we obey. And I say, obey. I did not say believe the gospel. I didn't say that. I purposely looked to a passage in Thessalonians which says, obey the gospel. How do we obey the gospel? What's the gospel? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us it is the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yes, I believe that. We do have to believe that. Belief does have a part. He that believes and, you know, there's another thing there. Mark chapter 16 is saved, right? But we still have to obey the gospel. How do we do that? Paul told the Romans, you got to be buried and you got to be raised. Where do we do that? In water. We go into a watery grave. We come out of that watery grave. Somebody entirely new. Read the first seven or eight uh, verses of Romans chapter 6. You'll find it there. That's how we obey the gospel. If you haven't done that, please do so. If you have done that and you got sin in your life, let's get rid of that today because we can repent. You know how I know you can repent? Go like this. You are still able to breathe. If you've got spiritual issues, God's given you time to resolve them. So whatever need you have, come let us know while we stand and sing. Just as I am and wrath on thee, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou didst come to thee.